Um, and before I forget, I just want to say thank you to UCC Boxborough for your incredibly gracious hospitality. It has been um, an incredible joy over the past two weeks to be communicating with you and to be planning with you and to be worshiping with you. And you truly are a very gracious, very vibrant and beautiful congregation. So thank you so much for welcoming me here these past two weeks. And now in preparation, oopsie, okay. I didn't wear pockets this morning. All women's clothing should be designed with pockets. I'm just saying, if you're looking for any work out there, design clothing for clergy. So let us come to this mindfulness bell. And as we come to this mindfulness bell, I remember one of my teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh, and he would invite us in a meditation hall to invite the bell. He would say, you never hit anything. <laughs> you, you don't hit the bell. You invite the bell. And when you invite the bell to resound in a room, may you also invite the Holy Spirit to come and dwell and be among us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Online, I'm Gloria. Please join me in the call to worship. God is eager to restore us to right relationships. The Creator is waiting to claim us now as God's own. We have come to meet the God who welcomes us. We have gathered to experience God's steadfast love. Listen. For God will speak to those who want to hear. Turn your hearts toward the one who saves. God will answer us and will give what is good. God restores us to faithfulness and righteousness. We come asking, searching, knocking. We come listening, learning, and praying. Our gathering hymn this morning is When Morning Gilds the Sky. Uh, it should be in your bulletin as well as online. As well as online. Let us pray. Loving God, when we come as your offspring to be reclaimed and blessed, we need the inner strength that comes to us through worship and prayer. 
teach us once again how to pray, take away the noisy clamor that would make us captives of human traditions, turn us toward the source of our salvation, toward your steadfast love and faithfulness. We pray this in the name of the very one who taught us to pray, saying, Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is said that human beings need connection just as much as they need food, water, even air. So our gathering together in one form or another is life-giving practice, not a luxury, but a need. This morning, as we greet each other with God's peace, even separated by screens or masks or distance, we are giving and receiving. What we need to survive connects into each other and to God. God's peace be with you. And also with you. Now, folks online, you're welcome to the chat box. And if necessary, we'll share a physical distance piece. We're joined together in a song of celebration. Be with you. And also with you. Morning, I'm going to be reading the first one. It is Psalm 24, verse 1. So listen carefully. The Lord owns the earth and all it contains, the world and all who live in it. Now, the small ones that are very meaningful. And I'll let Reverend Ian take it from there. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for that wonderful welcoming and naming our need for interconnection and interdependence as much as we need food and water. That was quite moving. And yes, a one-line scripture. How about that? The earth belongs to God. The earth is from God. The earth is created by God and we are God's stewards. Today, as I share a word for all ages, I bring up a word that actually wasn't even necessarily familiar to me, and I'm really curious if anyone has ever heard or know what a sharecropper is. Share, couple, couple of farmers here, sharecroppers, thank you, that's wonderful. I grew up in a sort of urban, suburban area, and we did not have farms in Norwood, Massachusetts. But I found out what a sharecropper was when I researched it, and there aren't many sharecroppers left in the world, that is for sure. Apparently, it's just a landowner who has farmland, and our poor farmers are suffering terribly under corporate farming, as we know. And when there was sharecropping, they were asked to um, plant seeds, and um, the sharecropper does all the work. 
and shares the profit with the landowner at the time. So today I have a story about a landowner and a sharecropper. Once upon a time, a very wealthy landowner had hundreds upon hundreds of acres that he wanted to plant with corn. So one day in the spring, he went to the village and he asked someone if they would like to plant the crop. Finding a willing and hard worker, the landowner took this person to his home and showed him the land and gave him the corn seed. He asked only that the sharecropper re respect him and that the sharecropper respect the land and to do his very, very best to produce a really good crop. Well, the next day, the sharecropper went to the village and sold half of the corn, and he kept the money for himself. He then planted the other half. And when the corn grew and was ready for harvest, the landowner couldn't understand, Where, where's the rest of my crop? The landowner cried, there should have been twice as much as is here. Oh, I, I don't know, I don't know, said the sharecropper. I planted the corn seed and, and this is all that grew. Sin of omission, friends. <laughs> the landowner was very unhappy, feeling that something must not be right. So the next spring, the landowner did the same thing. He went to the village and he found another sharecropper to plant his corn. And he asked only that the sharecropper please be respectful of him and of the land and to do his very, very best to produce a good crop. The sharecropper planted all the corn seed, plowed the corn and raised a really good crop. But, just before the harvest time, he took money from a busload of high school students who wanted to make a corn maze in the field. So the young person went in the field and they trampled down half of the corn, not really knowing what they were doing, but corn mazes are really fun. When the sharecropper landowner took what was left to the market, it was only half as much as there should have been. Again, the landowner was very unhappy and thought something just isn't right. The third year, the landowner went to the village and found a sharecropper to plant his crop. And he asked, was that the sharecropper, please be respectful of him please be respectful to the land and please produce the best and most abundant crop that you can possibly produce. This year, the sharecropper planted all the seeds and plowed the field to keep out, to keep out the weeds, to keep out the wild animals and guarded the corn day and night. When they took the crop to market, it was more than twice it had been the other two years prior. The landowner was very, very happy and knew that at last he had found someone who could be trusted. For many, many, many years, the two worked together and both were very happy. They were in connection and they were in community. This is just a simple contemporary parable, which Jesus used stories all the time, because truly a long, long time ago, God created the world and all that is in it and gave it to men and women and boys and girls and humankind to use. And, and God said, enjoy it. This is my beautiful land. Grow your food, gather your fruit, enjoy the streams and the oceans and the beautiful trees and breezes. Look upon the mountains with awe. I only ask that you please respect me 
and respect my land and return to me a fair offering from that which you, which you grow or earn. But you know what? Men and women, boys and girls, humankind have not always respected this land that belongs to God. The earth has been made dirty. The streams, the lakes, the oceans have been polluted, and we are often forgetful to return any kind of offering to God that we earn, never mind half of an offering. God really only wants maybe 10%. So you can see God is the landowner, and we are the sharecroppers. We don't own this land. It is not here for us to make a profit. We borrow it from God, and it was good. Will it be good again? May it be so. Amen. And so the sermon scripture this morning is a familiar one to all of us who have been in church maybe once in our life. This scripture is taken from the gospel according to Luke chapter 11, 1 through 13. This is the second version of the Lord's Prayer that we can find in the Bible. The first one is very elaborate and lengthy, and we can find it in the Gospel according to Matthew. And here we have Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. Now, Luke didn't want for intellect or use of words, but somehow it was important to him to just shave this down to its bare essence and put in what he saw Jesus teaching. So Jesus was teaching in a particular place, and then he was praying in a particular place. And after he had finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray just as John taught his disciples, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. And as Jesus said this to them, he also gave some examples. Suppose one of you has a friend and you go to that friend at midnight and you say to them, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has just arrived and I have nothing to set before them. And he answered from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed and I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give his neighbor anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you search and you will find knock and the door will be opened for you for everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and for everyone who knocks the door is open is there anyone among you who if your offspring asked for a fish, would give them a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, would you give them a scorpion? If you then, 
who are less than God, as the scriptures say, who are evil, know how to give good food and gifts to your children. How much more so will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? May these words of scripture be fulfilled today in our hearing, and may the Holy Spirit add a deep blessing to these words spoken. Will you pray with me? Creator God, brilliant God, scientist God, physicist God, you who through the eons create all that is good and beautiful. On this day, O oh God, teach us how to pray. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Mahatma Gandhi once said, prayer is not an old woman's idle amusement. Properly understood and applied, it is the most potent instrument of action. Prayer, action. This quote sits on my home meditation altar and it stands as a reminder of both the importance and the potency of prayer. Now in all four gospels, there are numerous examples of Jesus going off to a private place to pray, his disciples witness his lifestyle on a daily and regular basis. They sat around and they thought, there's gotta be something to this thing he does. There's got to be something to prayer. He certainly devotes a great deal of time and a portion of every day to be alone with God. So I can picture them sitting and discussing what did Jesus do when he prayed? Where is he going now? What did Jesus say to God when he prayed? How did Jesus pray? But I think as curious as the disciples were, I wonder with all of you if a more important question might have been, what happens when Jesus prays? Jesus' main teaching method, if you will, is leading by example. Watch how he lives his life. Watch what he speaks, watch what he does. Watch what he doesn't do and doesn't speak. He lifts up experiences and opportunities for his disciples, not only to witness him, but for them to have an experience of their own. Come and see when they asked him perplexing questions about the kingdom or realm of heaven. Come along and, come along and see. Luke's version of what we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer is far shorter than the elaborate one that we are most familiar with in Matthew. Matthew chapter six, verses nine through 13. In Luke's gospel, however, Jesus follows up with a number of examples and illustrations through storytelling. Yet in other of his most cherished teaching methods, he gives examples of persistence, almost of nagging, of knocking, of driving your neighbor crazy until they answer you. He gives examples of generosity and of God's desire to give that which is good, very, very good. We are told that we are asked we are to ask and it will be given to you to search and you will find to knock and the door will be opened i don't know how many of you even like country music or love country music but there is a wonderful song that 
caught my attention, and it's thank God for unanswered prayer. It describes how an enormous great disappointment, in fact, many disappointments, led to a particular outcome that was not part of a prayer request. It was a request that went unanswered, but it led to something far greater and far better than one could imagine. So yes, please ask, and it will be given to you, but perhaps not exactly or anywhere near what you were hoping for, because God has the large cosmic picture. Allow room, lots and lots of room for the Holy Spirit to answer in mysterious and even better ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. We think we know what is good and what is best for us and for our loved ones, but how much more so does God? Thy will be done, as is the more elaborate Matthew version, thy kingdom come, which is in both versions. One caveat. Before we even begin to continue to break down this prayer into meaning, let us please first acknowledge for some that the male dominating images of God as father and the reference of God's kingdom are for many a total stumbling block. They can't get past the first line. But as so many churches have, both SAC and UCCB have faithfully wrestled with this and sought to remove the stumbling block from their formal Lord's Prayer by encouraging images of that which invokes deep and profound and true love of deep trust, of deep communion, of deep connection, of everlasting relationship, such as creator or mother or beloved. For Jesus, it was Abba. Daddy, Daddy, he would cry. He was lifting up an example that was for him the most loving and trusting and selfless and constant presence in his life on earth. He would surely desire for us to do the same. Our creator, our mother, our beloved, our dearest, closest friend. So the point is to begin all prayer with addressing the Holy One. It's really that simple. The Holy Other, that which is not our small ego self, but that which is mystery and ultimately can never really be named. And then the second stumbling block is the patriarchal use of kingdom, connoting a male ruler. Again, context, friends, is everything. And it's important for us to know and not skip over, but to acknowledge that Jesus' use of kingdom of God or basilia in Greek was a deliberate and quite intentional affront to the imperial government of Rome, to an empire that ruled through might and power and fear and tyranny and oppression and was self-serving. Jesus seeks to point out that no government, no power, no oppression, no earthly ruler was or ever could or shall have the final say. It was a statement against empire and earthly powers and principalities. We would do well, folks, to understand this in our time, in our place, in our country, in our world. God alone is God. Biblical scholar, Jewish theologian, wonderful personality, Professor Dr. Amy Jill Levine, reflects on the correct contextual use of kingdom 
when she writes, I do wonder, do all those who pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, really want to change the status quo? Or are they pretty darn satisfied with the kingdom we have here and now? God's reign, God's heavenly realm is topsy-turvy, and we know the last shall be first. We know that the greatest among us will be the poor, and the wealthy will go away hungry. All one has to do really to understand God's heavenly reign is to read the Beatitudes. Spend your life reading the Beatitudes. God's kingdom. Another way of understanding this, where we are all truly siblings in Christ, where when one suffers, we all suffer. And when one rejoices, we all rejoice. This is more the reality of God's reign than any political agenda that seeks to align itself with its own interpretation of scripture. We too can wonder with Dr. Levine, do all those who pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, really, really, really want to change the status quo? Or are we all pretty satisfied with the kingdom we have here and now? I would also like to invite us to think of prayer, and I'm switching it up a little, to think of prayer as energy, chi, as a frequency, as a vibration, as a state of mind, as a state of higher consciousness. It's not up there and it's not out there. Folks, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. It's a state of mind, indeed. In this world and in God's creation, there are high, high frequencies. Musicians know this so well. But there are also very, very, very low frequencies. Some even go underground. God invites us to be receivers of higher frequencies like Mary that we spoke of last week. We too are invited to sit and simply listen when we pray, to recognize that God is our creator. God is our parent, not our thinking mind, not our ego, but something far, far, far greater than anything we can imagine. Prayer also isn't always about requesting or partitioning or asking God for something, although that truly is a good and worthy form of prayer, and we are indeed invited to do so. But prayer is far greater than that. It's about becoming aware. It's becoming awakened of God's living, loving presence, of God with us, of God in us, of God in others. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. A contemplative heart that seeks to tune into God's realm and reality far more than our own agenda. It's a heart that is seeking the beloved and where the beloved also desires, get this, God also desires more than anything to be found. Sometimes it is a game of hide and seek. So if our bodies need food to function and survive, how much more so do our souls long to be fed by the presence of the living God? Prayer is our spiritual fuel. It's the food. It is the source, with a capital S, of life in the spirit, which is eternal. Be still. 
and know that I am God, say to yourself. Be still and know that God is God. So I'll leave you with a little reading this morning from beloved poet Steve Garnis Holmes titled Spider. And just two things before I read this. I walked in this morning to these doors and I asked Nicolette, might there be a, a pulpit or something that we could set up? And as she was holding the door, in walked Larry. It was instantaneous. And then he brought this pulpit here and there's this beautiful canvas bag back here. And there is a spider, a very beautiful spider, not scary, a beautiful spider dangling from the strap. So I leave you with this poem. Spider, teach me of prayer. Happy with where you work, flowering shrub or rusting hubcap, the first leap from here to there, that suddenly possible connection. Repeated and amplified, that little no of hope extended, enlarged, layered out in the architecture of patience. The ever-expanding rounds, more like a window than a door. The thinness of your lines, yet how they hold the morning dew and shrug off the ripping winds. Teach me, spider, the grace of not getting caught in your own web. Not thinking or even looking how your little feet work the tight ropes on your legs as thin, well, as thin as prayer. And then the waiting. So still, so still, still waiting, waiting for the tiny bug of God to appear. Amen.
could God have chosen a more perfect speech for this morning? Thank you for that. We turn now to our prayers of the people, and I would just like to say that last week I had not communicated with Larry, um, I'm sorry, with Ralph um, and UCC Boxboro that I often request and lift up prayers from our Zoomers. And that, I come to find out, is not a tradition here, and it's a tradition at SAC. So um, poor Ralph looked like a deer in the headlights, and I am so sorry for having placed him in that awkward position. I'm even more sorry for those of you on Zoom who had prayer requests that you wanted lifted up, that you wanted voiced, and they did not get voiced. However, immediately following the service, Ralph got me a copy of the chat and of every single one of your prayers, and I could actually sit with them and pray with them. So know that your prayers have been heard and shall be answered. So please forgive me for last week and We'll try again today. I begin by lifting up in prayers a very dear and beloved friend, uh, Bob James, and his wife, Mary, Reverend Mary James. Uh, Bob passed away this week after a number of years battling cancer, and he died in the arms of Mary and all I can say to them is, well done, good and faithful servants of God. Rest in glory and peace, dear Bob. We pray for Blair and Kayla, both young girls who um, have been diagnosed with cancer and, um, and also another nephew who's been diagnosed with leukemia, who's related to Blair. So we lift them up and we love, oh God, to have, we're gonna make a very direct request, a cure for cancer really soon, please. And show us, oh God, how we are creating this and help us to cease in offering poison in this world. We pray for Deb Tucker, who is um, with Days for Girls and brought supplies to Liberia from July 7th through the 23rd. And as of today, she'll be traveling to Belgium through till the 27th. And so prayers for you, for your safety, for your ministry, and a warm welcome home awaits you. I ask you now, if you have any prayer requests here? Yes. Prayers for your friend Sheila, who's been diagnosed with colon cancer. May she be a part of that cure, whatever that may be. Others? Yes, Becky. Yay. Yeah. Oh. Amazing, amazing. Happy birthday to your 10 year old grandson and thank those college friends for their divine timing. How amazing. Any others? Yes, Nicolette. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that prayer for all who are traveling and gathering together and having reunions. May God's grace be upon them. 
and I trust that I will receive a list of the Zoom prayers after the service, and they too will be lifted up in my heart. So let us be together in a spirit of prayer. Beloved, teacher, friend, whose doors are ever open to receive your people, we want to learn from you how to pray. We long to sense your answering voice when we call. We are eager to receive a response to our earnest request. We want to persist in prayer amid all the competing distractions of our lives. We seek this, O oh Holy One, not just for our own satisfaction, but so that the world might become that which you created it to be originally, filled with wholeness and healing, where there is a place for all God's children, where diversity is seen and known and respected as your variety. In this coming week, Holy One, lead us beside still waters or a cooling breeze under a tree or a field whose flowers have grown wild. Lead us to a mountaintop or below in a valley where we look upon your magnificent creation and mountains. Lead us this week, O oh God. Call us this week, O oh God, to a place to go and be alone, to be all one with you. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We lift up all these prayers in Jesus' very sweet name. Amen. So uh, because of COVID, our offerings, of course, are not being personally collected, but you can find on Zoom and in your bulletin and on the website uh, a place to donate online. We also have a collection plate um, in the back, where? Back, woohoo, right over at that table in the back corner. It's a very important place. That's where our collection plate is. So on your way out, please feel moved or free to donate. May the faithfulness of God elicit our answering faithfulness. The good gifts of our heavenly parents call for an outpouring of gratitude. May our gifts given here be evidence of abounding thankfulness. Let us pray upon these gifts. Holy God, whose name is before all names, we worship you even with our offerings. They represent our labor, our investment, our stewardship of time and energy. May we be good share croppers, crop sharers. We want them to be put to the best possible use. May they save many from the course of that which would separate them from you and turn people toward faithful discipleship. May our gifts provide bread for body and soul, that your people may be preserved and strengthened for ministry. Bless 
O oh, bless and multiply our efforts and our offerings, we pray, dear God. Amen. I would invite you to stand now and join us in our closing worship. Lord, dismiss, dismiss us with your blessing. Please rise. And now in benediction, go forth, people of God, and worship the Holy One. Go forth and sit at God's feet and let the Holy Spirit teach you how to pray. All glory, laud, and honor be unto you, O Holy Creator. Go forth in peace. Alleluia. Amen.